Hello, uh, this is Barrett from the C4 Cyber Club here at Cypress College. Um, in this lab today, we're going to cover the CISA Plus Lab Series Host Hardening. So a very important part of any um, defense in depth security posture is hardening your endpoints, hardening your hosts, your desktops, um, and even just, you know, your home PC, right? So we're going to talk about uh, group policy management. We're going to set up some group policies related to password policies, um, acceptable use policies. And then we're also going to take a look at securing unused ports. So we'll do like a an MMAP scan, for example, see what ports are open. And then we can see how we can um, go into the Windows Defender firewall and, you know, block those ports. And then we're also going to look at applying uh, preparing and applying patches, uh, talking about uh, change management and why that's so important. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. This is kind of a long lab. You know, there's 42 pages in this uh, lab document, but a lot of that honestly is a lot of um, images and screenshots that are taking up a lot of the pages. So we'll take it a step at a time, <clears throat> nothing too crazy, but these are all very important um, methods that you should know on how to harden your system. And actually, before we get started, I brought up a tab here because I wanted to mention the Center for Internet Security, CIS. You should definitely be familiar with this. Um, CIS secure, I'm sorry, CI security.org. Um, but if you just Google mark or Google search, sorry, CIS benchmarks, Google mark, um, CIS benchmarks is something that they update regularly. And as you scroll through, you see that they have these documented benchmarks for all types of services. <clears throat> so Amazon Web Services, Amazon Linux, um, Apache Web Server, Mac OS, CentOS, Debian, um, even Docker containers, you know, um, recommended CIS benchmarks. Uh, Google Chrome, and then as you scroll down, you'll see we'll get to Microsoft Windows for both desktop and server. So yeah, you see, um, they have benchmarks for most of the platforms out there and operating systems, even Zoom as well. So I highly recommend that you check that out. Once again, CIS benchmarks, um, and you can definitely learn a lot of really nice tips on how to secure these systems. All right, so let's go ahead and do this ourselves on the Windows 2012 server. So I'm gonna click on this. Now, <clears throat> if you're also doing this at home and you're in the NetLab environment, we can't press Alt Control Delete from our keyboard. So we'll click up here and send the Control Alt Delete command. And you can see that, that was sent. Okay, so now we can log in. Uh, password is password123. Obviously, that probably wouldn't uh, meet password complexity uh, requirements like we're going to see here in the lab. But as you know, these passwords are kind of meant to be easy just for our, our practice. All right, so we can close the server manager. We're not going to be working with that today. And we can right click on the start menu and choose run. And for me, it's already auto filled, um, but you'll want to enter in gpmc.msc. And this is going to open the group policy management. Okay, so within here, um, we're going to go under domains to group policy objects. So I'm going to double click to to uncollapse that or expand it. And now we're going to right click on group policy objects and we're going to create a new policy. And we're going to call this the GPO password policy. And essentially, in a nutshell, what group policy is, is um, it allows us to make sweeping changes to multiple um, computers within our system um, through one policy. So we can enforce this on multiple um, PCs, for example. 
Um, so name, GPO, password policy. We'll press OK. And now we can edit. I'll right click on GPO policy. We can edit this. And now this is where we're going to get in more detail and set up a password policy. So you can see here the, uh, the location of that. We go to policies, Windows settings. Whoops, click the wrong thing. Windows settings. And then in security settings, we double click there. And then account policies. Now we have the password policy here. We also have account lockout policy, which is definitely um, useful to set. So that would be if um, there are five failed login attempts, it would lock out the account, um, assuming that that might be a brute force uh, password attack, perhaps. But here uh, we're gonna we're gonna work with the password policy. So we could double click on that. You see we have these options, enforce password history, maximum password age, minimum password age, minimum password length, and then password must meet complexity requirements. Um, and then this final one, store passwords using reversible encryption. Um, this would be recommended to leave this as is um, because you don't necessarily want reversible encryption. Okay, so first thing we'll do is maximum password age. So let's go ahead and double click that. We want to define this policy setting and we're going to change this to 90 days. And on, on all of these, if you want more details, um, you can click the explain tab and it's going to give you much more detail about, um, you know, this security setting determines the period of time in days that a password can be used before the system requires the user to change it. So that makes sense. Uh, once it hits 90 days, the user is going to get prompted to change their password. Okay, now when I press OK, it pops up, it's suggesting a minimum password age. And we'll, we'll go ahead and press OK. So we'll take the suggested setting of 30 days. And so you can double click here, minimum password age. What is that? Well, this determines the period of days that a password must be used before the user can change it. So you can't change your password within the first 30 days after you've changed it before. And now let's go ahead and move on to minimum password length. So we're gonna set this to, I believe eight. Yes, we're gonna set this to eight. Now it's interesting to note that, and we'll look at this in a moment in the password complexity, whoops, in the password complexity section behind here, it actually lists six. And I think NIST guidelines currently, oh no, no, they, never mind. they recommend eight. They recommend eight as well. So we're going to set eight here. Okay, and, and then now this next section, um, the password must meet complexity requirements. When we double click that, we want to go ahead and define this policy setting and we want to enable this. Um, now let's let's check out the explain section. And this is what most people are used to when they're setting up passwords. You need to have an uppercase character. You need to have a lowercase you need to have base 10 digits, so zero through nine, and you need to have at least one special character or non-alphabetic character. Um, and now in this requirement, it says be at least six characters in length. I think NIST guidelines are probably, I feel like they updated them to at least eight. I know a lot of people recommend at least 12 because um, length is is definitely, definitely important um, especially when you're dealing with uh, password crackers and in fact i would highly recommend um, just doing a google search for nist password guidelines um, so i found this website here it's at auth0.com and this would be really good to go through um, just to get a better <clears throat> deeper look at password complexity so you know they started to say length is is better than complexity um, eliminate periodic resets. Sometimes, um, you know, workers can get a little bit, um, burnt out by too many constant password changes. Um, so yeah, they, they have a lot of much more detailed 
um, you know, don't use password hints, limit password attempts, multi-factor auth authentication is, uh, you should use it on every, every um, important and sensitive login for sure. Because at the end of the day, even if somebody was able to retrieve your password, um, MFA would likely uh, stop them, right? So yeah, I, I would definitely recommend also on top of the CIS benchmarks that I recommended, um, check out the NIST password guidelines for um, 2020 would probably be the most updated. Okay, but for anyway, anyways, for now, we will set this. It is technically needs to be six characters at length, but remember, we also kind of overrode that here and we determined it needs to be eight characters. All right, so we did that. So we review it, everything looks good. Now we're gonna, we're gonna let me uh, move this a little bit. Okay, so we can exit out of this editor and we're gonna create a new group policy object. We're gonna call this AUP consent agreements. And AUP here stands for acceptable use policy. So once we create that, we'll go ahead and right click and edit. And we'll want to expand policies, Windows settings, back to security settings. And now we're looking at local policies. And security options, we'll double click on that. Now within here, we have a bunch of different options where we are looking for interactive login, message text, and let me, oops, there we go. Let me, this a little bit bigger. In fact, I'll just maximize it. There we go. So we are looking for message text for users attempting to log on. And then we're, we're going to also change the message title. Okay, so double click. So this is the text that users will get when they attempt to log on. We're going to define this policy. And then we're just going to type this in here. Okay, so I got mine typed in. Uh, feel free to, to you know pause the video um, while you get yours typed in as well. And then once you're done, you can go, go and press OK. And you notice that it shows up here on the right under the policy setting. And next, we want to choose a title. So I'm going to double click on that. And the title will just simply be AUP Consent Agreement. Oh, missed an R. There we go. Okay, I'm going to press all OK here. And that is updated. Okay, now if we go back to um, exit out of the editor and we're back in group policy management, uh, we can click on the AUP consent agreement and then down here in security filtering, we're gonna click add and we're gonna add everyone. So anyone attempting to log into this machine, um, will have this acceptable use policy uh, message pop up. Okay. And now we're going to right click on CISA.org. We're going to link an existing GPO and we're going to select both the AUP and the GPO password policy. Um, you can press control, hold in your control key as you click on both together. Then we're going to press OK. All right, now we are good to do a restart. So I'm going to right click on the uh, Windows menu, shut down or sign out. I'm going to choose restart. Press OK. All right, so now we need to press up here, send the Control Alt Delete key again. And now you see we are greeted with the acceptable use policy. Um, looks like I messed up with the formatting a little bit there, but that's okay. 
you can see that it, it it is displaying what we chose for the message. And then up here is the title that we selected. So we have to press OK. We accept this. And then we can log in. So password one, two, three. Which interestingly enough, like I mentioned earlier, that password technically does not meet the uh, password requirements anymore. Um, but essentially for any new users um, that you set up, it would require. All right, so <clears throat> now we're moving on to part three of the lab where we're going to secure unused hosts. So I'm not sure if we're still going to keep using the 2012 machine. Oh yeah, it does look like we will be. Um, but first we need to move over to Kali because we're going to use Kali to do an MMAP scan to look for those open ports. Go ahead and log in there. Log in as root, password is T-O-O-R. And of course we'll want to come to the terminal and we're going to run an MMAP fast scan on 192.168.1.2. And so remember the fast scan, um, this is scanning the top 100 most common ports. As Nmap, usually by default, if you don't add the dash F option, it's just it's going to scan the top 1,000 ports. So hence the name fast scan. It's not scanning quite as much, only the very most popular ports. And there we go. Uh, that scan took 14 seconds. And we could see we have port 53 open for DNS. Uh, we have port 88 open for Kerberos. Um, and we have other things like um, NetBIOS shares, um, LDAP port 389, for example. But for this lab, we are going to focus on DNS and Kerberos. And let's say we want to make sure that those are not open and not accessible. So we're going to go back to the 2012 server. And here we're going to uh, right click, choose search, and we're going to look for firewall with advanced security. And as you start to type, it'll start to show up here. Okay, so we can set up an inbound rule. And we could we could specify that those ports are blocked from incoming traffic. So let's go ahead and click on inbound. And we're going to choose new role over here. And we're going to, uh, what type of role would you like to create? So we could set by program, by port. We're going to choose by port. And are these TCP or UDP? Um, we will choose TCP and specified local ports, 53 comma 88. So those were the two ports for DNS and Kerberos. And what do we want to do? Which action should be taken? We want to block that connection. And where, when does the rule apply? We'll leave all of that select by default. We'll give it a name. We'll say block ports 53 and 88. Whoops, just realized I had a slight typo. Wouldn't make a huge difference, but there we go. All right, and now you see <clears throat> the uh, kind of X'd out um, icon here because this is a inbound rule that's blocking. And we are, you see over here under action block, all these other ones are allows. All of them are allows. But here we want to very specifically say we're blocking 53 and 88. Now, what do you think is gonna happen if we rerun that MMAP scan. And remember in Linux, um, you can just press the up arrow and you could rerun that command, pull it back from uh, the bash history. All right, and our results are back. 
lo and behold, we have no longer <clears throat> port 53 and port 88 um, as open ports here. So that makes sense. Uh, Cause remember over in our firewall, we have blocked those ports from incoming traffic. Now let's go ahead and scan the Ubuntu machine. So remember the Ubuntu machines over here, we've been scanning from the Kali machine down to the windows server. Let's go ahead and scan this machine here and we'll see what's open. All right, so on the Ubuntu machine, we have two ports. We have port 21 for FTP, and we have port 80 HTTP. So at this point, we were wondering, okay, well, they have an FTP server running, and maybe they're running a web server, um, but maybe that's not the case, or maybe they don't want that. Um, so as we see in the lab, it's looking like we're, we're gonna need to deactivate FTP. So this is file transfer protocol. Um, this is definitely something that if you do not need it, um, you do not want to have this open by default. Because a lot of times, um, sometimes you'll find that a misconfigured FTP server can also allow anonymous login. And then you might find that an attacker can somehow put a uh, malicious file onto your server, potentially run it server side, and that can get very messy very quickly. So Going over to the Ubuntu machine, let's see how we can disable this. So the password here is also the same, password123. And we are going to use a handy tool called Netstat. So Netstat allows us to see um, any active TCP um, connections that are established, but we can also use it to find the process ID of a particular service as well. And this is going to come in handy because we're going to also use the command line to, um, to end that, end that process ID end that task. So let's go ahead and run netstat. We'll use the sudo command because we need to elevate to root privilege to run that. And we're going to add some options. And this is basically um, what's needed to get this process ID. And we're gonna also use this pipe command. So we're basically saying, take the output of this netstat command and send it into grep, which if you haven't used grep yet, um, this is basically a way to search within either a file or in this case, it's, it's just standard output. Um, from this Linux command, and it's going to search for colon 21. And as you can see here in the image, it has the colon 21 in red. So it's basically looking through all of this and, and going to print out only the line that has colon 21. And since we ran sudo, it's asking us for our password, which remember is password123. And now it runs that command. So you can see we technically only got back the FTP information. And we're able to see the process ID, which is 2347. Now, when you run this lab um, on your own net lab, the process ID will be different. So make sure you note that. Um, you, you This next command, it will not be exact as mine, um, but you'll need to run this command to get this process ID. And just for added context, let's run this um, netstat without the grep, just so you can kind of understand what grep does. So you can see how it prints out multiple connections and processes. So we have all these different process IDs that are linked to, okay, here's an Apache web server, for example, all these other uh, system processes here. But then when we, let me clear screen. I'm going to rerun that command with grep. We get only the line we need. Okay, so moving on, now we need to run the kill command. So the kill command will end this process ID. So we'll need to run sudo again for that. 
That is definitely a administrative root level privilege. And we type in 2347, um, or at least I do. Um, once again, you will add the process ID that your NetLab returned. Now, if I rerun that netstat command with grip, we get no results back because the process related to the pro FTP D server um, has been killed. So if we go back to Kali, I'm going to clear screen. Um, control L is a handy shortcut for clearing the screen, by the way. Um, if I rerun that scan on the Ubuntu machine, we can make a pretty good guess that we will no longer see 21. Yep, and there we go. Now we only have port 80 open. Makes sense, we saw an Apache web server running as a process, so for whatever reason, um, that Ubuntu must need that port open, but not necessarily port 21 for file transfer protocol. All right, and then moving on to the fourth section of the lab, uh, preparing and applying patches. So here we're gonna be working on the server 2012 machine. And if the server manager is currently not running, uh, we'll wanna open that up. It is uh, this icon down here in the taskbar. And once we're in here, we're gonna to go to manage and then add roles and features. Uh, you could also click on it here. So from this section here, we're just gonna press next, leave this set on role-based or feature-based installation. And we're gonna keep this on the bob.sysa.org server. And then here, we just press next. And now I believe, yes, it's within this section, we need to specifically select the Windows Server Backup. So this is what we're going to install. All right, and we'll choose Install here. Okay, yeah, that really only took about 10 seconds or so. So from here, uh, we can go ahead and close that. So now that Windows Server Backup is installed, uh, we can proceed to create a backup. So we'll go to Tools here, and we're gonna go down to Windows Server Backup. And we're gonna select Local Backup here. And then we see um, the available actions over here on the right side. So let's go ahead and choose Backup Once. Go ahead and select next here, leave that selected. We'll do the full server. We'll leave that on the local drive. Um, so you could potentially back that up to a remote shared folder. This gives us the review, or this is actually um, where you could designate a specific destination. So we'll keep that on the E drive here. So you'll get this pop up um, as a lab notes. Um, we'll just go ahead and press okay. Do you want to exclude this volume from the backup items? That's fine. Are you sure? Yes. All right, so here's our confirmation. We can go and click backup. And so as the lab says, oh, you know what? I came across this before. Um, so likely something something uh, happened in the installation of this lab where there actually isn't enough space to do this backup. Um, but I think that's going to be okay. I don't think the backup was necessary for um, the further steps in the lab. But this was a nice overview of installing um, the, the, the option to um, create a backup within Server Manager.
Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and exit out of there. And now we're going to take a look at launching PowerShell and um, potentially um, checking to see if a particular hotfix is installed. So do we need to launch this in admin mode? I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to right click on PowerShell run as administrator. And let me go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so I'm going to type in git hotfix. The ID is KB291935. And as we press enter, we see, okay, cannot find the requested hotfix. So we need to actually, we realize we actually need to install this. So let's open up the file explorer. We're gonna to navigate to the C drive under updates. And we're gonna double click on this update. So this is the one that we just searched for within PowerShell. Okay, so we can see that we're actually unable to uninstall this um, because there is a prerequisite needed. Um, so the prerequisite is the update right here, ending in, ending in 9442. So let's go ahead and double click that and install this one. Okay, yes, I would like to install. And now that particular hotfix is being installed. Installation is complete. Now we should be able to install the 9355. All right, I'm gonna press yes to install. Initializing done, installing update for Windows, update one of one. All right, so that hotfix update is finally complete. Uh, it definitely took a good solid uh, five minutes or so, but you could see it kind of makes sense because the size of that hotfix was much bigger than the other one. So we have uh, nearly 770, or I'm sorry, 707 megabyte update there. So uh, once we get to here, we're gonna want to go ahead and restart. And we'll just log back in under the uh, administrator account. All right, so we're greeted with the uh, control delete to sign in screen again. So we're going to go ahead and send that here. And password one, two, three. Uh, so we can go and close down the server manager as that loads. We won't need that. And essentially, we're just going to be going into PowerShell and we could just verify once more that the hotfix has been installed. So git dash hotfix ID KB2919355. And there we go. We can see that that was installed uh, today. Very good. And I know this is a long lab, uh, but we have come to the end. So we're going to work with using Windows Defender to increase security. And we're going to see how we can um, change um, and enforce Windows Defender um, security roles through um, group policy object. So for this last section of the lab, we're going to need to log into the Win client. So I'm going to go ahead and click over there. We're greeted by the lock screen. So we'll have to send the control alt delete again. And then it's going to ask us to log in as SISA forward slash administrator. So I'm actually going to choose other user down here. 
make sure that we get logged in to the appropriate account. And then password one, two, three. Okay, so we're greeted by the server manager. Uh, we can go ahead and exit out of that. And we just wanna go ahead and search for Defender. So we'll open up Windows Defender. Okay, we can go ahead and close that. Now, the lab shows that it should have been turned off by default, but it looks like it's already turned on. So that's okay. That's that's a good thing, right? <laughs> so um, basically, you know, if you ever notice that your Windows Defender is turned off, you definitely want to make sure that's turned on, unless you have another third-party um, malware or antivirus protection. And something important to note during this part of the lab, if you see any notifications that your virus and spyware definitions are out of date, um, you can just ignore those. So remember that these... Um, NetLabs are sandbox, so they don't have access to the internet, um, which is why you know, it's unable to update those definitions. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at how we can actually enforce um, Windows Defender settings through group policy. So if we right click on the start menu, go to run, uh, we type in gpmc.msc to open up group policy management. I'm going to go ahead and maximize that. So we're going to expand the forest, sisa.org, uh, the domains, and then we want to go into this domain here. And we want to take a look at the group policy objects. So here we can create a new GPO. So we'll right click. And in fact, let me bring this over a little bit so you can read a little bit better. Uh, so we want to right click on group policy objects, select new, and we'll call this the Windows Defender policy. Okay, now that that's created, we can right click to edit it. And this is where we can make um, add add policies here. So under policies, we'll go to administrative templates and then windows components. Then from here, this is where we're going to find windows defender right here. And now once we're in windows defender, we're going to take a look at this real time protection. So here you, you notice that we can get pretty granular with the features. And so we want to enforce that. Um, we want to make sure that we scan all downloaded files and attachments. So I'm going to right click and choose edit. So you notice currently it's not configured, but we want to go ahead and, and enable that. So it's going to enforce that anything downloaded or any kind of attachment gets scanned by default. We press OK there. Now, if we look over here on the left side, these are all the sections underneath Windows Defender. We could choose Scan. And we want to make sure that it stays updated. So we're going to check for the latest virus and spyware definitions before running our scheduled scans. We'll go ahead and enable that. Press OK. We also want to specify the scan type to use for a scheduled stan scan. I keep saying scan. Um, so here we're going to right click edit, choose enable, and now here we can select full system scan rather than just a quick scan. So we're forcing a uh, much more deeper full system scan. And let's specify the day of the week. So we'll enable that. Once we enable it, we get the option down here. 
lab is recommending every Tuesday. And then we could do uh, specify the time of day. We'll enable this. And so you notice that this, this time, is the number of minutes past midnight. So this would currently be two hours past midnight, so it'd be two in the morning. Um, the lab is recommending we change this to 180. So that's adding another 60 minutes or another hour, which would put us at 3 a.m. Okay, so we'll press okay. And that brings us to the end of the lab. So yeah, in this last portion, we just um, we took a look at Windows Defender. I'm sure a lot of you are pretty familiar with that. But more importantly, you could see that within Group Policy Management Editor, creating a GPO or Group Policy object <clears throat> based around that is how you can get super granular and really enforce a lot of these different details of the scans. And with that, that concludes this overall lab. I know it was a big one, a lot of things to cover, um, but one of the most important aspects of security, which is host hardening. You have to start at your own endpoints, um, make sure that your system is protected. And that becomes a, you know an overall important aspect and uh, part of a in an overall defense in depth so thank you very much for watching and i will catch you in the next one